this is, this is, this is. Michael DeMonte, <laughs> welcome. How you doing? Uh, Thank you. Author, journalist, uh, your new book, Hey Suburbia. It's a, a guide to uh, the emo slash pop punk rise out now, available everywhere. Um, I, uh, I skimmed it. I didn't get a chance to read the whole thing, but I, I did read some chapters and, I, and I, I went through it. And there's a lot to get into. So, I mean, let's talk pop, let's talk, uh, pop punk, yeah. emo, yeah. punk rock, everything. Let's talk about your book and how it you know, all relates. But uh, first, you're from Houston, Texas. Uh Yes, correct. That's or you live in of, you live in Houston, Texas. You're maybe not from there, but where are you from? I'm, I'm originally from uh, the Northeast. I'm originally from New York. Uh, we moved to Texas when I was 13. Okay, okay. So, and uh, yeah, part of that move is like you know I went from New York to Texas, and, then, and right in the in the middle, we lived in like Pennsylvania for like half a year. And when we lived there, I, I had no friends. I was, you know, played Dungeons and Dragons and watched wrestling. And I had like one friend. And when I left, he gave me a bunch of CDs. And that's how I kind of discovered this genre of music was through the CDs he gave me. And I kind of brought that with me to Texas. Yeah, but, I was going to ask, was it Texas? Was it, you know, so it was Pennsylvania. Yeah, so he gave me, it was like some old school, you know, like Juliana Theory, uh, Get Up Kids, and uh, Blink uh, Cheshire Cat. I remember listening to these records and there was something about it that like something went off in my head. It was one of those things where it's like, there's something here. There's an energy. to it. I just don't get it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yet, like, but it really opened up this thing. And, you know, I, I grew up in the nineties. Um, so, you know, in 94, you know, green day hit and then 97, you know, blink hit. So, you know, and then through 99. So it's like, I was listening to like nineties alternative rock and oh next thing you know there's like pop you know pop punk and punk rock and ska bands on the radio too. So it's it really was my opinion the nineties were the golden age of music. <laughs> yeah, a lot of good times. It's funny you the get up kids uh, early on, like their first whatever their first release was, I I heard about them from fans, some some friends of mine that were from Virginia Beach or somewhere out there in Virginia and they were like, hey, check out this band for Get Up Kids. And I was like, oh, this sounds amazing. This is great. This is cool. We ended up obviously playing with them and touring with them quite a bit. But uh, it's funny how, like, especially even even me being in a, in a band, um, I don't know if pop punk was 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 a thing then, but, but punk rock certainly was. Uh, you know, when it was our, our first couple tours, so 95, 96, it's 97, somewhere in there. And... I was discovering bands just like other kids from from other people, from other you know fans and people I would meet along the road. So kind of like you, you know, not just in my hometown, Bremerton, Washington. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, yeah, I mean, so getting into punk rock, it, it seems like uh, a lot of it back then and probably still is today. It's just your friends, you meet somebody, and they're like, check this out. and And that's word of mouth. That's... I think that's how it, most of the bands that we grew up playing with, including our own, really got our start. It was word of mouth. It was just like there wasn't the internet like it is now. I mean, of course, it works the same. It's word of mouth on the internet. But but back then, it was, what was it? It was you go to your friend's house on the way to Texas, right? Yeah, it was that. And it was also, I mean, God, it was such a great time. It was trading CDs and uh, magazines and, and reading interviews of bands and then they'll name drop another band. And I discovered so many bands just from hearing about the bands that influenced that, the bands I, I liked. So yeah. I just remember early on, you know, you go through that phase where it's like a lot of kids who grew up on pop punk, it's pop punk first, right? It's Green Day, it's Blink, but then you start listening to bands that influence them, start listening to the Screeching Weasel, Descendants, Operation Ivy. So then you get into like the older punk, you go to Ramones, Clash, Damned. And then it goes into like kind of like the the '90s epitaph, you know, Bad Religion, No Effects, and then it, you go into hardcore, then you go into emo, then it's it's like it's all cyclical, and you know, it's all under this big umbrella, this this you know this you know I dub it like Warp Tour generation, you know, all these bands are kind of all subgenres of basically the, the same genre. Um, but yeah, you definitely go through those phases when you're discovering um, you know punk rock, and I just remember I went to um, there was this like used retail. Uh, place by by where I used to live. I used to walk on the way home, and they would sell used CDs. And I remember seeing uh, Dead Kennedys, Fresh Fruit for Rotting Vegetables, and I was like, "Man, there's something scary about this. They're like dangerous." 
And I remember hearing about them like, oh, yeah, I, some of these bands I like reference Dead Kennedys. And I listened to it and like it blew my mind. And I was like, wow, there's an activist level to punk rock, too. That's really, I think, what punk rock is all about is about, you know, kind of being yourself and, you know, empowering people. So, like, for me, like, you know, some of those early punk rock records were just as important as the pop punk stuff. You know, you discovered punk rock. You moved to Texas. How, By the way, how was Texas? And then how did you find journalism and writing? Well, I mean, Texas right now, I mean, it's kind of crazy a place to live. I mean, you know, you live here as well. Um, yeah, it's kind of crazy place to live right now with everything going on. And hopefully in the next couple of years, you know, the leadership changes here and it's slightly safer, <laughs> slightly a safer place. But um, no, I started writing uh, my high school paper, really. And that's where I really discovered my love for it. And I remember I would just do like CD reviews and stuff. And uh, in college, I went to the University of Houston and uh, – the school paper there. And when you do journalism as your major, usually one of your classes, depending on your program, is you work for your school paper. And they give you a beat that's not something random. So you don't get to write about whatever you want. So I got technology, which I knew about at the time, and it was kind of like baptism by fire. But at the same time, I was able to still write about whatever I wanted. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to write life and arts and features and uh, you know music stuff. That's what I was passionate about. And it got to the point where I was churning out like over 10 articles a week uh, I was basically writing that section by itself. And at the time, uh, college publications were really a target audience for a lot of labels. So we got so many opportunities being, you know, that key demographic for these labels. Like they would send us CD shows. I was able to cover Warp Tour. Uh, my Probably the biggest interview I'd ever done was uh, Tom Bill uh, from Blink backstage at Angels and Airwaves. And that was for my college paper. That wasn't even for the professional paper that I eventually went on to work for. So yeah, like so much opportunities opened up for that. So that was my, you know, my early um, introduction to kind of music journalism. And while I was going to school, I got a small, uh, I got my foot in the door, a small gig doing some copy editing at night at the Houston Chronicle. So how it worked is I would go to school, work for the school paper until three, then go to the Chronicle at night. And I would do that grind for like three out of five days a week. And once I graduated, I just kept my job at the Chronicle and I went up to the features department and said, hey, I've been writing about this, you know, these bands in college. And I know you guys have two salary music writers, but you guys really don't cover this this genre of music. I would like to every once in a while, you know, write for you guys. And I said, sure. So that's kind of how I started, um, you know, doing some stuff for the Chronicle. Because I was like, look, I just want to cover some shows. I could take my own photos. I could get my own press interviews. I'll do it all. You don't have to pay me extra. I'll just do it because I, I love going to shows and all that. They said, okay. So that kind of got me you know, writing about that stuff. And I was like, hey, so I'll cover stuff like Warp Tours. Anytime like punk rock bands and pop punk bands would come to town, I'd you know interview the bands or cover do, do coverage. And we post it on our website. Sometimes we do print stories to preview um, the, the shows as well. And I remember the biggest story I did for them was um, Blink's uh, reunion tour. I interviewed Tom over the phone to preview it. And they put it on the front page of the entertainment section. So that was pretty big. And then, you know, covering X games uh, for them as well. So yeah, that was really like, you know, a punk rock kid slash living their dreams. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. You're doing it, doing it in a, in a way that a lot of band guys do it, but for journalism, for writing. Yeah. So let's talk about the book. Hey, suburbia, you know, so years later, you, you know, you've, you've racked up all these miles of, of interviewing all these bands, writing about all these bands and, and music and the scene. So you write a book. Um, can you talk about it? Hey, Sub are you a, are you a Screeching yeah. Weasel fan? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, I am. All the, all the, the title comes. Yeah, all the chapters have very clever, you know, band title influenced titles. It's it's kind of fun. So, what thank was, you. And, and I know people like you would get that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right away, um, right away. Yeah, no. So the, yeah, so the book was something. Yeah, I was thinking about all these great stories, all these great interviews that I've already done through the years, kind of you know, covering covering this scene. I was like, how can I tell this story? And this is something I wanted to do five years ago, um, before you know the quote unquote comeback that's kind of happening now. I want to do this five years ago, but I couldn't find a home for it or a way to kind of make it where it was something unique. And finally, when I came up with the idea to do it as a coffee table book, it really kind of came all together. Because if, if I can incorporate not just you know the book itself, but some interactive things like playlists or um, 
essential albums, uh, essential songs, um, artwork. And the artwork is done by uh, Cassie Potter. She's an amazing artist. She's done work for Census Fail, Less Than Jake, Sum 41. Uh, she actually designed Census Fail's skull logo. She's amazing. And I think her uh, tied it all together. Um, so, yeah, and I, I just wanted something, you know, that you can put lie down on a coffee table or just kind of pick up while you're on the toilet, you know, and something that's easily digestible. And so that's how the book kind of came about. I had, and putting it together was really easy because I had so much of the, the heavy lifting already done. Do you have a copy on you? With you? Yeah. Yeah. Let it, yeah. There you go. There it is. Yeah, it looks great. And yeah, I can see the influence or, or you know, the, her her art being, uh, you know, senses fail and it's very iconic looking. It's cool. Yeah, she has a she has a distinct style. Like for example, you know, she took the Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge by My Chemical Romance and kind of made it her style. Oh with yeah. The skulls. Okay. And. um like, so what's what the book kind of what is the book cover did. what is the book cover like it's the the is so it the cover it's not is, history you know, no i meant what does it what cover what what is it oh yeah okay what do you talk so about it really does it really starts from the beginning uh, because basically i want someone to pick up this book who is into this stuff and who read it and nostalgia automatically comes to them right or if they're new to this genre they'll pick it up and learn about the roots mm -hmm. right learn that Punk didn't start in 1999. You know, learn about the the epitaph boom. You know, learn about regionally how you know how certain bands and, and certain sounds and everything. And I, really, if if you're a fan, especially of the late 90s, 2004 era, you know, it takes you back. So I talk about the influence of MySpace and you know AbsolutePunk.net, which started off as an MXPX and Blink fan site, uh, which a lot of people don't know, and that became one of the biggest, most influential. You know, I think. Uh, websites at that at that time period. So it's not you know it's really everything. There's there's like a dress code in there. You know what, what people wore back then, um, culturally, what was happening around the world that like influenced um, the, the boom as well. So it really does cover um, from the from the beginning to kind of where we're at now and everything in between. And it's done in a way where it's it's informative, but it, it's not like overbearing in the sense where you can like I said you can just read it as you go, learn something. And just, you know, pick up, pick it back up with. That's cool. The lines get blurry when it comes to, you know, what's, what is considered pop punk, right? Because there's some songs that would be like, that's definitely a pop punk song, but maybe some bands don't always have the popular stuff. So like, what would you consider, or is there a band that would be the first pop punk band? So I, I really think, I mean, people, purists may disagree, but I mean, the Ramones are technically the first pop punk band, if you think about it. And the first I mean, punk band. And the first punk band. So <laughs> you can argue that the first the first punk rock band was a pop punk band because the Ramones were just super catchy back then, even though, you know, intrinsically they were raw, stripped down. But God, their music is so catchy to this day. It is. I, I don't think pop punk means polished. It means catchy, right? It means yeah. melodic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think the, I mean, I think the Ramones are super catchy. Always were. They're always one of those flagship, you know, influences for me as a songwriter. But yeah, and, and I, I had Lou on from Sick of It All, and he was talking about how he's like the Sex Pistols set, talked about how they had the first Ramones album in hand when they were making their first record, so they couldn't possibly be the first. You know, like like. The Ramones were the first punk band. I mean, yeah. So, um, but pop punk. I mean, okay. So let's let's move forward after that. Like, who else was there? Other pioneers back then. I think Bad Religion. I mean, they're very melodic, but they're not considered it's, pop punk, are yeah. they? It's yeah. It's weird. It's like all, all those Epitaph bands are super catchy, but you would never say. You know, generally, you wouldn't say No Effects is a pop band or Bad Religion is a pop punk, band, even though they're just as melodic and catchy. And it's weird how. Like Bouncing Souls is another band who they write about everything. They have so many different types of songs and they have like these really catchy sing along songs, but no one ever called them a pop punk band. Mm -hmm. And it's weird, like MXPX, you guys are always categorized as a pop punk band, but you have songs that sound up like straight punk rock songs, you know? Yeah. A lot of y'all, you know, faster stuff too. So it's, it's like an interesting thing how some bands get categorized, even though there's certain songs and moments you could say, oh, well, that's, this is a punk rock band, but this is a pop punk song. At the end of the day, it's all the same thing, in my opinion. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, with the Descendants, they were they're a perfect example yeah. that we're heavily yeah. influenced by them, yeah. and they had super catchy songs, and then yeah. they had really like hard. I would almost say like prog rock type songs. So you're like, I I have no idea what they just did, but it sounds really cool. You know, like so they 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 teetered on the line of that, and then they you know even with their band all. Uh, very progressive, but also screamy. A lot of screaming, you know, depending on the singer. With Chad Price, he would scream a lot. So, like, yeah, they would go pretty far. And I always felt like, okay, that's that feels good to me as a songwriter. I don't want to just sing or just write songs that are, like, melodic and poppy or just hardcore and punk rock and, and nasty or whatever it is. Like, I kind of like the whole genre myself. And so why not write about it, you know? So I think all the bands in their own way kind of do that, you know. Uh, Rancid's a great example. They've got very right. catchy pop ska songs. They've got, uh, you know, your, your what, what like a normal punk rock Rancid type song. And then they've got like the hard, hard crust punk stuff, you know? So like we all kind of do this. Uh, so we all can kind of like, okay, that's our pop punk set or whatever, you know, set of songs. <laughs> Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I was going to add to that real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Um, one of my favorite quotes, one of my favorite quotes in the book is from Milo Ackerman, um, the descendants. And when I was interviewing him, I was asking him just kind of about pop punk. And he's an elder statesman. And he said that they never were territorial about it. Right. Because to them, they always saw the descendants as basically it started with the Ramones and Buzzcocks. Then it went to descendants, Green Day and Blink, and then the lineage. So he always saw the bands that came after them, like Green Day and Blink, as just the step, and as the bands that came before the Descendants, like Buzz Cox and Ramon. So he, there was no territorialness about that, you know, because back then there was like this kind of divide about sellouts and this band's not punk, this band's not pop punk. But a lot of times you, you really only heard that basically through, you know, kids and through magazines. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's really interesting to, to hear, you know, you know, someone who helped create the genre basically say that, no, you know, they were never like Green Day or Blink, you know what I mean? Like, so that, that's that's a really great quote to, to understand that he, he understood the lineage of, of pop punk and punk, how it progressed. Yeah, he's got a lot of wisdom. And, and that's something that we didn't have when we, were, when we were like getting started back in the day. And everything gets in your head. One little thing, one kid will say something and that'll get in your head. And, and what you really need is perspective to realize it's a big world. It's a big community. There's, there's all these people out there and some of them are going to hate you. Some of them are going to love you. You just got to do what you do and you have to be unapologetic about it. You have to just love what you, what your band is. You have, you have to have pride in that, you know? So like, yeah, I, I respect those descendants guys. Um, I, I got to hang out with them and, and get to know them on the 97 warp tour. That was like the, my first time, like, like, uh, just chilling with them, you know, just playing video games and, and they, yeah, it, it was like experiences like that, that that made me a lifelong fan of punk rock because because it's not just about the music. It's about it's about the whole life. It's about your whole lifestyle. So and I'm not saying you have to live in a cardboard box or anything. I'm just saying treat people the way you want to be treated. Right. It's pretty simple. But uh, yeah, I love the descendants. I love I love all the you know, I. I listen to no effects back in the day i still do you know those guys are amazing and uh to be to be part of that has been cool too you know to be part of the scene that i once when i was a little kid starting out mm. writing songs and then all of a sudden we're on stage with all these bands it was weird like i i went i got my first very first tattoo was poking at your punk right here <laughs> yeah, i don't know if you can see it but it's, uh but it's in there and the day I got it, I went to see, me and Tom Musneski, our guitar player, went to see Lagwagon and Strung Out at the Velvet Elvis in Seattle, Washington. And this had to be 1994, I would, I would assume. So it was before we had ever toured. We, we were in the band. We were doing MXPX. Obviously, I had the tattoo. And our album wasn't out yet. I got the tattoo before our album came out. So this was probably the summer right before... Our album came out in the fall of 1994. Yeah, I'm, I'm right on on the years. So anyway, <laughs> just uh, just that whole experience was amazing. Getting to see getting to see these guys that I'd listened to on tape, cassette tapes, CDs, 
and they're right in front of you. You know, even though I'm in a band, and and then years later, touring on the Warp tour with like you know doing co-headlining tours with with Lagwagon and uh, Strung Out, we've played with them so many times. It, it's just I don't really think about it all the time. I guess I'm thinking about it because we're talking about it, but uh, yeah. it's cool. It's it's like it's a childhood dream for sure. Still well, I always feel like you guys were were peers with those bands basically right right away almost, you know? Um, and that's how I always felt as a fan. I always felt like I never thought you guys were like these young kids, you know, playing the war tour. I always felt like from the start you guys were kind of one of those, not veteran bands, but, you know, one of those bands that people would mention mm -hmm. side by side with Wag Wagon and NoFX and all those other bands. Yeah, we had a lot. I mean, we definitely had a, a pretty – fast ramp when once we started doing warp tour and play we were we were, our, we did like dance all crashers i would say is a big reason why we're here they they took us out on tour when we were just this little band from bremerton because we'd played with them in seattle and then they like brought us on a whole national tour it was amazing uh awesome. then that got us the face-to-face -to -face tour um and that was great too and then from there we pretty much just were constantly touring uh, blenderhead as well blenderhead from seattle took us on tour there they, they were a tooth and nail band um but at that point you know it was uh we didn't really know we were just we we're just doing what we were doing and it's all a blur at that you know at that juncture but speaking to your point about you know being peers we didn't really feel that you know we felt like kids we were always younger than everybody um but i I see what you're saying, and it's important to note that the way people see you is often much different than the way you see yourself. And so we were uh, we were very meek, very meek when it came to we didn't have a lot of bravado. We tried to do it all on stage, but but uh, <laughs> I wasn't the kind of guy that would uh, talk too much shit in the press or or anything for that matter, you know. But uh, anyway. Yeah, let, let's let's keep going. I want to talk more about pop punk. I want to talk about um, where it went. You know, when after you know, Warp Tour was huge for so long, um, and we were doing pretty much every other every other year or every couple of years. You know, we'd do the Warp Tour. But how many Warp Tours did you end up going to? Oh man, I went as soon as I discovered Warp Tour. I basically went every year. Yeah. I don't remember the first year. Um, first year I went as a fan before I started covering music. Um, it was, I want to say, Bad Religion, New Foundry, No Effects. And then when I started, first year I covered it was Paramore, uh, uh, Jim Class Heroes, Katy Perry, Angels and Airwaves, played that year. And then the last year, I covered it. Um, yeah, the, the last year Warped Tour was older bands like that. I felt like I, I may never get to see again, like TSOL. I wanted to cover them and newer bands like War and Woman that I thought were important to cover because it was good that the Warped Tour was booking more feminist punk rock bands, especially after the previous year when they had uh, that guy from Port Step on the tour. And that was like a big, a big thing. And I cover that in the book, too. Uh, but no, some like the earlier Warp Tours, I remember, you know, I think the first Warp Tour I ever covered for the Chronicle, I got to interview Greg Raffin from Bad Religion, which for me was like a bucket list moment because I love that band so much. And I remember other Warp Tours where it was like monsooning here in Houston. And I got to interview many times. I've interviewed Matt Skiba many times, um, but that was one of those funnest interviews on his bus at Warp Tour. I remember, you know, walking to the bus and their bus number was 666, which was very fitting for that band. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, just, I mean, so many like of my little punk rock kid dreams came, you know, true covering, you know, Warp Tour. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it was such a great time, not just as a fan of music, but also as a music journalist, because, you know, Warp Tour was always very, uh, very friendly with press in terms of the opportunities. And a lot of the bands were always down to do it because, you know, they had so much downtime that day. There's only so much you can do, you know, stuck in a parking lot. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, people get into trouble, right? <laughs> now and again, now and again, there's been some some mayhem. Well, you know, I'm thinking about it, and it changed. Warp Tour changed even the years that we were playing. It was different from the first couple years lineup. The first year I went was the first year. It was, uh, I guess it was 1995 or something like that. Uh, I could be wrong by one year, but I think it's about that. Anyway, 
the lineup was Social Distortion, L7, I think No Doubt was headlining, um, No Use for a Name was on a side stage. So, I mean, there were like a lot of punk bands. Wizzo from from uh, from Germany, a German punk band. Um, it was a great it was a a great thing, you know. It was it was like this is cool, and a couple years later they had sort of figured it out a little bit better because they they were using a lot of existing stages and stuff like that and uh by the time we played they had these like truck stages and the truck stages were were crazy because they would set these up all over the place and and the one we started out in 97 we did play the main stage a few times but but uh mostly we were on this truck stage where if it's really hot out that's the stage is metal and it just gets blazing hot and i was wearing chuck taylor's i don't know why i was i guess they didn't give me vans yet but uh <laughs> and my chuck taylor's were melting to the stage one day that's how hot it was anyway uh nine yeah that fir- but that first going back to that first lineup though like i just knew that this tour was going to do something it was going to be something fun i didn't really even think oh we're going to be on this tour but Eventually, we were a bunch of times, so it was good. Uh, what speaking to the fact that it changed over the years, you know, it became heavily sponsored, and the lineups changed a bit. There was a lot of hip, there was hip hop. Uh, Kid Rock played one year, you know. So, what do you think about that? I mean, I think in retrospect, I mean, of course, it's a business, and you got to do what you got to do, but. Um, there's the old school punk rockers always have have a little problem with those kind of things. Well, yeah, it was interesting because like you're right, they they incorporate like some rad hip hop acts. Like I think Ice Ice Cube played Ice T played one year. Yeah, yeah. Um, Eminem played. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gym Class Heroes were were kind of like they were a band, but they also you know uh, rapped as well. And then you know, like Katy Perry, and just like it's just crazy to think you know that these acts at the time. Were soon become these like pop acts, mm-hmm. um, but I mean it was kind of cool to have that infusion of you know. I, you I know, always like, liked it. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't just a punk rock thing, but it was cool because like the spirit of the tour was still like a punk rock tour, and I think a lot of the bands who were on tour got it, um, you know, got that what it was, and I think if there was rock star attitudes, it, you know, it didn't fly. You know, it doesn't matter who you were. You know, it was a cool thing about it. You could play any time of day. Um, I just remember, you know, as a journalist covering it, you know, it was cool in different years to, because like when you write about Warped Tour every year, it gets old. So every year I try to approach it differently. Mm. So one year I approached it as bands like Bay Size, Saves the Day, Newfound Glory. They were the new veterans of the tour now. That's kind of what my story was like, because at that time, you know, Rancid wasn't playing it as much, no effects, better, like the older bands, because it's such a grueling tour to do. So every year, you know, I try to approach it differently. Mm. But like, you know, still though, you know, even though they incorporated more metalcore acts and more emo bands and more electronic music, they still had those bands that, you know, they were basically tied to the roots of the tour. You know, bands like New Found Glory, Saves a Day, who, who were, you know, prominent bands on the bill. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I mean, Real Big Fish was on there a lot, too, with yeah. the Scott stuff and Less Than Jake. Yeah, they us and Less Than Jake always seem to be, not always, I think we probably did a year, but we always were on the opposite years. But we, <laughs> we love those guys. We're good friends with them. But yeah, it's funny. But I mean, Warp Tour for bands is is like where you hang out with, you, you meet people and you hang out and you have gangs of friends and you're friends with other bands. Because aside from that, there's really no other tour that happens that you can have time to hang. Usually even on a regular tour, there's just too much going on. There's t- it's it's busy. So that's what I found anyway. And and especially nowadays with people flying a lot more rather than being on tour buses, you just don't have the time. But Warp Tour was always like that that moment that that chunk of you know that season of of like okay, it's like this is our summer. But uh, the rest of the time, you just like it's pure just work. Like let's go to work, let's do our thing. But uh, people would let loose a lot on Warp Tour. And, and you said that, you know, as a band, it's work. But for me, I always felt it was work for me, too, because I was covering it. Yeah. I was taking pictures. I would ha- I would miss bands I wanted to watch because I had to go interview bands and actually do work. But it was fun work. You know, it's like, yeah. oh, I, I may have to miss a set, but I get to interview Yellow Card or, uh, you know, Greg from Bouncing Souls. So, you know, you have to make those tough decisions. But um, And then yeah, those, artists, those artists are missing 
the bands they want to see as well. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But like those bands, though, they could just see them another day because it's such sure. a long tour. But one of the things I mentioned in the book that it really became a the thing to do. You know, you have people going to Warp Tour just to go to Warp Tour. Like you have like the jocks and the cheerleaders or the everyday kid you would see at the mall yeah. would go regardless of whether they knew the bands and then they may discover a band, which I thought that was, was really good for the bands. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it sounds like if you don't really think about it, it sounds like, oh, that's lame, just going, just to go. But yeah. but it's great for, for just discovering new music. And, and if you want to be part of it, it means you're doing something right. Like if, if random people want to be part of your festival and come there, then that's a great thing. You always want to have that event, you know, the, the can't miss event. Super important. So um, Alt Press, they were a big part of Warp Tour after a while and, and a big part of pop punk and, and being champions for pop punk, which I actually just found out today that uh, there was a video they put out that was like the top 10 most influential punk bands of t the 2000s. And MXPX was number one. Wow. Yeah, above Blink-182, Green Day, every, you know, like It's like, okay, all right, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm sure there's a lot of people pissed off. <laughs> but, but no i mean you can make you can make that argument for a lot of bands but i think you guys are specifically when people got into mxpx they got into them because when i got into to your band i went and i bought like all the cds it wasn't just i'm gonna buy this one cd i heard one song it's like i know i like these guys already so it was really kind of like how many back albums can i get and you know to learn about this band so yeah you guys are one of the bands when i first heard you right away i liked it because it sounded like the punk rock stuff i liked and the pop punk stuff so yeah, I can see that. And Alternative Press, you know, you're saying back then, I mean, Alternative Press, MySpace, AbsolutePunk.net, PunkNews.org, like those were just like, those were big sites for bands and helping them break. And I interviewed uh, Scott Heisel, who used to be editor, one of the editors at Alternative Press for the book too, and kind of how that that publication really helped break a lot of bands um, as well. So yeah, that was a great, great era. You yeah. Know, print, print in general is kind of dead now, but during that time, I mean, I remember going to the store, going to Barnes and Noble to pick up copies of the War Pro preview and reading it or top 10 bands you need to see. And I think ultra impressed now it's a little bit more clickbaity, but that's kind of like all news outlets now a little bit. Yeah. They have but, to do uh, that to survive, huh? Yeah. But do, do you do that? Do you have to do that? You have to like write weird headlines. I used to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was part of my job. I'd have to write <laughs> or, or, or tweets that were like Texan star to miss the season opener and you click on it and it's no one you've ever heard of. So it's, yeah, it's yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it's getting worse and worse, but yeah. I mean, but yeah, but you're right. Alt press really, they really threw down for so many bands. They, they would like have sections of like meet this new up and coming band, you know, or a bunch of them. Um, they would have like tech corner, which was, I always thought was kind of yeah. cool. Like meet somebody's guitar tech, which yeah. was basically just an easy way for like other bands to poach, good crew members <laughs> i don't know how many times we would have our crew members like all of a sudden they're gone they're they're moving on up it's all good but uh it, it's a sense of pride it's like if you have somebody that's worked with you for a long time and then they get a, a job with like a really big band it's, all right uh, approved <laughs> i don't want to name names there's a there's a lot but uh but i i loved all those sections in in alt press and and it was just they did a good job with uh, making it easy, easy reads. Um, they they put some agency into artists' hands and let artists write some some columns. And I don't know, it, it was cool. I think I wrote a few, a few little blurbs in there now and again. But alt press, yeah. The uh, the book business. I mean, that's another thing that's probably more niche than ever, right? Uh, yeah, selling yeah, physical I would, books. I would say, though, in some degree, I mean, I'm old or is school. More like like print, is it more like vinyl? Is it more like vinyl? It's, it's, is, it's, oh, is that what I it is? I was just going to say that. It's very much like vinyl. Now people want that physical copy. So vinyl is coming back. Um, and now I think people want physical copies of books, too. And I, I think, bet books you know, are so, easier to get printed than vinyl right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard something where, like, independent artists have to, like, press their vinyl like four or five months in advance or something it is it is yes absolutely, yeah. absolutely. and you guys just put out a, a giant box set not too long ago so that that must have been in, in the works for a while i would think yeah that was in the works from the beginning of the year and it's still 
just delayed on shipping. I mean, even, even they did a pretty good job still not bumping us too far back in, in the actual production lineup. Um, but the shipping part, you know, we can only wait because it's going to go on a giant ship and it's going to travel halfway around the world and then it'll get here. So, I mean, I think it's in that process right now. But with COVID, the excuse is, oh, it's taken longer because because COVID, you know, so you can't really do much about that except for just keep on people or whatever. But back to the books, um, that's good to hear. I mean, if books are, are more like vinyl or a collector's thing, people want to hold it. Um especially a coffee table book, you know, you don't necessarily want to read a coffee table book on your, on your Kindle. So talk about, yeah, exactly. talk about the, the book business. Yeah, exactly. Like you make a great point. This book is made for print. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's made for something lying around. Um, I've written other books before. I've written some other nonfiction books about UFOs. I've written a young adult, uh, fiction book as well. Um, but like as a as a author, especially when you're you know if you're not Stephen King, you're not signing this huge contract. You know, like I'll say this: my royalties pay maybe a couple of bills a year, so it's nothing like you know, oh you wrote a book, you're rich. No, it's not how it works. I mean, and I think a lot of musicians can attest to that too. Like just because you have an album out, you know, doesn't mean you're a rock star or anything like that. But I, I do think the physical, tangible book business is kind of on a revival. Um, just, just like vinyl. Um, because for me, if I really like a record, I want it on vinyl. And if I really like a book, I want that book. Like I went in and ordered a bunch of older books. I like growing up just to have in my, in my bookshelf. Cause it, it looks cool when you have yeah. people over, you have your vinyl records, you have your books and it really speaks to something about yourself too, what you're interested in. I think people kind of like to display that. And it's really cool. Cause I, you know, I, I teach and all my, a lot of my students like are into vinyl too. So it's really cool that you have teenagers that are are getting vinyl of their favorite artists too and one of the big things here uh we have record store day in houston uh cactus music is the the big local record store and they carried my book which is super cool and i went there to kind of go autograph copies of my book and they, it was packed um they had a ticketing system to get people in to kind of get their, their their first cracks and it was like crazy busy all day so it's really cool to see you know yeah events like that um, really, you know, generate a lot of traffic, especially for mom and pop, smaller businesses too. Yeah. I, I want to talk about your UFO book, but, uh, so do you think before we do that, do you think you just kind of have to do, just make more like, like a band has to keep making music. You just got to keep writing and that will eventually sort of stack your royalties up a little bit more to, to eventually be a little bit more reasonable. I don't know. Is that, is that realistic to think that, okay, if I just, if you just keep writing books and they do the same, if not better than your last book, right? Like you want to not go down, but is that a winning strategy for, for an author you think, or. I don't know. I, I think I, I really like to make the, the parallel to music, right? Like, you can keep putting out albums, right? Mm -hmm. But you have to wait for that one hit to kind of do something. Push through. Um, yeah. Or the right appearance. So what I've noticed from writing books is I've gotten a lot of podcasts. I did a TV pilot one year. Um, so I've had a lot of opportunities from writing writing books. Um, for this book, it's got a lot of positive press. Um, being on your show to me is huge. So if I sell 10, 20 books for being on your show or 100 books, like even, even if I only sold five, to me that's a success. You know, um, like little things like Mark Hoppus's clothing site. Hi, my name is Mark. Featured uh, interview with me on their little blog section. Like that's huge having that on Mark Hoppus's site. And like any other other podcast that I've done, big or small, it doesn't matter. To me, that's an opportunity. And like I said, I make that parallel to music. That's like, you know, a band gets a gig opening for a medium sized or a larger band. And then next thing you know, a bunch of kids you know, another band takes, you know, takes note and then they take them on tour. Things kind of blow up that way. So I always look at writing books as like an opportunity. It's an opportunity to eventually do more. Um, but I think this book has gotten a really a lot of positive feedback, which is um, really reassuring because part of this book is meant to kind of cause debate, especially when you do an ultimate playlist, you yeah. know, <laughs> of songs and stuff. It's like, and no one has really talked crap on it. They're like, oh yeah, these are all great songs. I'm like, okay, cool. People are too did nice. You, did you... People are too nice in the pop punk scene, by the way, right? <laughs> yeah. Did you look to see on that list which MX, MXPX song I chose? I did not, actually. That's the one thing right. I didn't check. I checked I, all that. I, I put um, My Life Story. My Life Story. Yeah. That's a good song. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that fits in perfect in terms of like bridging the gap between like, you know, where pop punk was going and kind of where it started. And that's one of my favorite MXPX songs. But it, it was kind of out right around that time too, like right in between those booms in the '90s and 2000s. So that was my. It was between that and um, this may sound like a dark horse, but uh, Secret Weapon. Oh, okay. Uh, that's that, an, that an, album. An... Yeah, that album came out right in the in the 2000s boom. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I li- I really like that song. I mean, that's. <laughs> I stand by that song in particular. There, there's, there's definitely songs that I'm like, okay, that was, that was solid. All right, and Secret Weapon would be one of them. My Life Story would be one of them. So you've got, you've got a good ear, I think. Um, I always wanted My Life Story to be the single, and instead it was Responsibility, which is I also like. But, but yeah, My Life Story could have been a really fun video. It could have like really taken us somewhere. But those were back in you know the major label days where they just they just were a little scatterbrained. It seemed like there wasn't a folk. It was like oh, I'll just try this one thing and then if it doesn't work, yeah, it was it was a weird time. It was a weird time for for us just in our career. I think you know just not we were just doing whatever we could to just let's let's just keep making music and keep going and keep touring. But uh, I I would say. I would say, yeah, we we uh, we knocked quite a few songs out of the park, but then overall, there's some songs that I'm not proud of on on like say Secret Weapon or something. But that's just a lack of of really having time to to let it sink in, which is something nowadays we do much better. I think we let it sink in and we like really be ha- you know let ourselves be happy with something that we release. Yeah, I would I would argue that. Y'all's last record may be probably your second best record. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know. I, I can't think which one to be number one right now. I really have to think about that one. But <laughs> it really sounds like this is this band and this is kind of all they've done through their career. And it all kind of, it all is cohesive. Thanks. Yeah. I, and but, the goal is to, you know, if we, if we make another record, it's got to be better than our last record. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's so much work. It's, it takes so much effort and, and it's so much money, you know, to shell out yeah. that uh, it's got to be it's got to be worth it. You know, it's got to be like something we want to talk about in interviews and we want to yeah. just keep gushing about. Yeah, that's that's important, I think, for when you get to be, you know, we, we just turned 29 a couple of wow. days ago, you know, a couple of weeks ago by the time this is on. But yeah. Anything you do is important, I think, at that point. Like, we're, we don't want to be just a, we don't want to be a, a nostalgia act. We want to be a, a right now, putting out music right now that people want to hear. And that's probably the biggest challenge of, you know, that any band like us and our peers face is just to, I, I don't even want to say stay relevant because I've never, I mean, I've tried staying relevant in the past maybe a few times, and it's just never really worked. And so I've realized, no, don't stay relevant. Stay fresh. Stay fresh with whatever you're doing, whatever is important to you. And and if a, if a song's good, you kind of know it. You can feel it. You're playing through it. And and that's all that's really we're focused on right now is, is just staying fresh. One of the things I, I mentioned in the book, that there was l- longevity with a lot of these bands, even though like when MTV and radio dried up when that, you know, these band, all these bands still persisted and toured sold out shows. So like the scene never died just because it wasn't mainstream anymore. Like all these bands have been touring for years and a lot of them, some of them don't even really have to tour to kind of make money, but they do it anyway, because whether they're, you know, relevant or not, there's still a fan base. So mm-hmm. I always felt like, you know, especially throughout the scene, you know, th- these bands have always served their fans very well by continuing on, keep going, putting out new music. And um, yeah, that's one of the, the things I mentioned in the book that, you know, none, no, none of these bands really went away. Um, and Chris Caraba kind of made a, a good quote from Dashboard Confessional in the book, how they, you know, when the emo scene kind of died down, they're kind of knocked down a peg and they felt like it maybe needed to happen, but, you know, they still persisted and, you know, they still had their fan base and, you know, now now some of these bands are, you know, as new kids are discovering as emo nights are like a big trend, mm-hmm. you know, you have or, you know, older people are sharing this music with their kids and stuff. It's like it's it's kind of coming back in a sense. And you see Machine Gun Kelly making a pop punk record, Will Smith making a pop punk song. So it's like it's in, you know, when, when I was trying to sell this book, I was like, you know, this music is still relevant. I mean, I said My Chemical Romance sold out there 
uh, their entire world tour in 45 minutes. So these bands are so relevant. Yeah, that's in, that was insane. So yeah. we should talk emo. Like, like, where did that start? We talked about pop punk. I mean, is is the Ramones the the first emo band as well? <laughs> I don't. That's that may be even loosely categorized in pop punk. It's it's so you know it's so hard. I mean, there's the emo purists who go to like Mineral, uh, Promise Ring. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, I would say yeah, Amer yeah, American football kind of those bands. But then you have like you know bands like the get up kitchen incorporated kind of keyboards and these these pop punk elements to it um and then you know jimmy world and you know taking back sunday those bands who really elevated it to mm -hmm. you know mainstream you know the, those are jimmy world and you know taking back sunday are big alternative rock mainstream bands so to this day you know and then you have my Camp romance which is this giant band that you know even when they broke up their popularity almost went almost went higher so it's like it's just crazy that you know um these specific bands really redefined kind of what people would normally think as emo. Cause you could say, Oh, well, this doesn't sound like jawbreaker or this doesn't sound like, you know, um, for me, promise ring, but for me, it was like sunny day real estate because yeah. they were from Seattle, Jeremy Enig. And mm -hmm. we would see, we'd see them play. And that to me was what I thought emo was. It was like, mm -hmm. um, very emotional music, right? So it was uh, something sad, usually. <laughs> it was like yeah. always a sad song. And it was, and to me, I thought it was like, okay, you got to be real quiet. And then you get loud. And so I actually had a side, we had a side project called Arthur. Uh, we released oh, yeah. a full length in, in an EP. And those were just like emo songs I wrote. They were like 1950s style, like pop punk. On, you know, there was like a, a bedrock there. But... But it was really the idea was to to be dynamic more than MXPX was and to be sappy and to be emo. So like that was sort of my attempt at being an emo band. I'm, I'm, I know it doesn't really sound emo, but in, in the way, the very beginning, like when it started, my idea was, okay, every song is going to be real quiet and then really loud <laughs> but there were there were bands like that, do, that would do that you know um they were like post hardcore almost and that was also kind of what i thought emo was was like this post hardcore thing um of course hardcore also stems from punk as well but so when emo got big it was more like Jim, the jimmy Eat worlds and and stuff like that and blink 182 even kind of went emo y on uh, their is it the self titled album, with yeah, like, title, yeah. Uh, I miss you. That song, great song, really. You know, um, yeah. What? But but who who is uh, who is the biggest emo band? Who who's the pinnacle? Oh, uh, it's hard. I mean, you. I think you look at My Chemical Romance and Paramore as being kind of like the most popular ones. But to me, my, Paramore. Me, you think they're emo? Really? Uh, to me, they're uh, like. They're like pop, punk, pop rock, pop punk. They fall under that umbrella, though, too, though. They do get categorized under that, too. It's weird how it's that all kind of... If you go to Emo Nights, they're one of the most like most played or requested bands. So sure, it's, sure. But you're right. You know, sonically, they sound more pop rock or pop punk at times, mm -hmm. sonically. But, I mean, for me, I mean, the Get Up Kids is probably the greatest emo band of all time. And that's just me being biased because I love that band and... Uh, Matt Pryor is one of my favorite songwriters, and he's one of the nicest guys I ever met or interviewed. Um, so I always look at the. And tech, that was the first emo record I ever heard. So, yeah, and so, what's their first record? Do you know? I don't know if off the, I don't uh, know it's a uh, uh, four minute mile. And would you say that is their that's emo? Like was that when they? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh definitely. Yeah, that that was the first one I heard. Then for sure, four minute mile, and uh, yeah, to me it was it was it was punk, but it was different, which yeah. is kind of why where emo kind of came from you're saying yeah. a little bit yeah interesting um or like you can also take like slower pop punk songs or or mid-tempo and say that's an emo song like i always thought let it happen could be categorized as an emo song if you if you really wanted to pick it apart true it got it gets super slow and then yeah. super fast it's like the it's kind of like the dynamic thing but with tempo yeah. <laughs> yeah no you're right okay yeah you could i mean Bands like we saw bands like Jawbox, uh, they were great. We saw them on tour. You know, they were they were touring, and we somehow saw them play. and And that was another example of they weren't considered emo. They were before emo kind of existed, but they were considered what post punk or some some sort of like progressive punk. But they kind of did 
a lot of really interesting things that emo bands do, which is like singing, a little bit of screaming, like loud, like quiet, loud. The screaming thing was was huge, right? It became yeah. such an issue where you're like, okay, another screamer. Like, oh my yeah. god. <laughs> It became its own genre, Screamo. Screamo, yeah, yeah. Do you talk about that in the book? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I kind of touched base on it. Um, I was never a giant fan of it, but I understood it was popular and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's funny how you know stuff that was categorized. Like one of the, the favorite quotes from the book was from uh, Stephen Jenkins from Third Eye Blind, because they take a lot of emo bands on tour. They take Saves the Day, Dashboard Confessional, and I I interviewed him uh, a couple years ago. I asked him about that, and he said for a while in the press, people were calling. Uh, third head blind and smashing pumpkins architects of emo and he was like what the f is emo okay i get that weird like, i never heard that but i was like hmm. okay interesting i think it's because of the influences because a lot of yeah. ba- a lot of bands that uh not my generation but after my generation bands grew up on third eye blind they grew up on silver chair <laughs> Which is yeah. like a grunge, a grunge band that was influenced by Nirvana and Pearl Jam, you know. So, yeah, but a lot of yeah, that that's interesting though because I could see that. Where I wonder what that is for like punk bands like us. Like, what did we listen to that wasn't punk rock necessarily? I'm sure there's a few a few of those connectors in there. We'll we'll figure it out. Not while I sit here and think about it, but uh, I want to talk about about. UFOs and punk rock. You you wrote a book about it, so you must have some ideas, some thoughts. And and lately, there's been a lot in the news about the Pentagon and the the, the government, the U.S. government, anyway, um, disclosing things about UFOs. One, they can't disprove anything, but two, they can't actually prove. So they don't really know where all this phenomenon is coming from. So, what does the book cover? What's your connection? What's what's the idea here? So. It really started as like a, a trilogy. The first book I wrote was Punk Rock and UFOs, Cryptozoology Meets Anarchy. And that title was influenced by Greg Raffin's books. Um, second book was Punk Rock and UFOs, True Believers, Bouncing Soul Song. And the third one is Punk Rock and UFOs, Stranger Than Fiction, which Bad Religion Song. So yeah. there's definitely the influences. Yeah. But Stranger Than Fiction was definitely encompasses my all, all my work with UFOs. And it really just tries to normalize the paranormal through current events, pop culture, mythology, religion, and where I've, I interviewed, you know, scientists, U, UFO researchers, um, witnesses, people in Hollywood who make these TV shows, make these movies, uh, experiencers, um, well, people behind the scenes, uh, military witnesses I've interviewed for the book, people who uh, help shape our pop culture, like people who work for like DC Comics, um, so, so college professors. So I, you- I, I got I got Tom Melange in there. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I was gonna say you probably you probably got Tom in there. He he's yeah. all about yeah. so to the stars, all that. Um, one, so you, you obviously believe in UFOs. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course, absolutely. What's what's your main sort of like? This is why I believe in UFOs, it, and I, I don't not believe in UFOs. I just don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, well, it's hard. I think you know if you look at it from a physicist point of view, where it's mathematically plausible that uh-huh. otherwise exists, then you say, oh, well, okay, it, it, you know, it has to be real. But just from everything I've read and seen, my own sightings and stuff, is absolutely real. And and it's now, we're in the kind of golden age of this stuff where the you know there's a new story, a new video dropping almost like every month now. And yeah. mainstream media outlets are taking it seriously and the, the Pentagon is taking it seriously. And not to say that I haven't previous years, but now they're admitting it. Because for years, they've kind of under the radar, some people, not the, the government as a whole, but there are quite a few people with official government titles who read into this stuff. But it's out of the fringe. So, you know, when they say, when the government says, yes, the phenomenon is real, then it's real. So you think, uh, you don't think it's it's somewhat like China with secret, secret programs, space programs or anything? I mean, that could be also happening, yeah. right? Absolutely, that could be a case, but most of the people who have witnessed the stuff, especially the military witnesses uh, and some of the scientists who kind of looked at the data, one of the quotes you hear all the time from different people is, it's not of this world. And when you hear that from these high-ranking officials in government and military, then you should kind of raise your eyebrows a little bit. 
yeah, it's like, should we be scared? Not probably not. I mean, but no. <laughs> but it's like <laughs> not unless you see some giant thing above yeah. above the light. It's so hard. That, I mean, there's deep fakes. There's you know yeah. you can literally like make a fake video of a celebrity. So it's it's hard to know when you see a video if it's so, you know some CGI thing or if it's real, and that's going to play into it. You know, as going forward. So if there is anything that ever does really happen. There's still going to be people going like, ah, that's fake. You know, I don't believe it. But I'm, I'm interested to see, you know, what what we can sort of figure out if if we do come in contact with any aliens, if we can figure out how to do better s space travel, you know, all of those things, you know, because we've, it seems like they're constantly doing the SpaceX and then now Bezos yeah. is, is going to space. Um, but that's going to be a while before it's normalized like like it would be with with aliens i don't know i mean so where does punk rock aside from tom delong where is where is punk rock fit into everything so early on it was so think about at the time ufology cryptozoology was is an underdog science right and okay. you know, just like how punk rock is an underdog thing it's almost like this um you know, underground uh, community, kind of like punk rock. And, 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 big, and like Bigfoot, like, something like Bigfoot. Yeah, like yeah. Big, yeah Bigfoot. <laughs> but I looked at it as, a, you know, we have this rebellious nature in punk rock, what we choose to rebel against. Well, we also have a rebellious nature in what we choose to believe with in general. Yeah. So I really incorporated that element into kind of the books too. That's, so that's how the punk rock comes in. Any uh, flat earth ideas come to mind, like next book? No flat earth, no. hollow earth. Hollow earth? Are you, you believe hollow in hollow earth? earth? Oh, yeah. You believe that the Earth is hollow? Uh, well, not the Earth. Well, that there's parts of the Earth that are habitable, and People there's do. been a lot of sightings. There are certain parts of the Antarctic where you're not allowed to fly over. And apparently back in the day, um, so a few military planes flew over it and saw just UFOs just leaving. So, yeah. It's a, it's a whole giant crazy rabbit hole. We so could, could hollow, so hollow Earth has to do with aliens. So that's connected. Potentially. Potentially. I mean, well, there's this idea that they're not extraterrestrials, they're ultra terrestrials, meaning they're of this earth. They're, or they're oh. on this earth. Oh my God. Yeah. I, like I said, Mike, we could do it, go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> well, let, let's end on this, but I want to hear a little bit more. So, uh, ultra terrestrials, yeah. do they, they look like us? Do you think? No, they... that's just the, that's no? just the idea that, you know, that they're not coming from space, they're coming from here. They're coming, oh, but they're like like a Neanderthal or something like that. Or like a gray alien, traditional gray alien. Because a lot of these, these sightings happen, a lot of these military sightings come up from the water. Right. Well, yeah, yeah there's a theory that the gray aliens are like maybe humans for, in, in the, the future. future. And we've, yeah. we've, you know, we don't need gender anymore. We don't need muscles. <laughs> <laughs> We just have big brains. You move everything with your mind. Uh, I, I don't know who it was. I was listening to a podcast, I'm sure. And they were saying that telepathy is not possible. But it's like, how can you say that? You don't know. Like, it could be possible, I guess. I, I don't. It, everything, each year that goes by, things happen. And you're like, I never would have thought that that would happen. So well, science fiction becomes science fact. Yeah. So I. Yeah. Hollow Earth sounds crazy, but without sounding, without hearing more and knowing more about it, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say it's impossible. Yeah. It's it's possible, especially if there's aliens and they're using. But why the Earth? Because it's one of the only planets around here that's habitable, probably. I mean, I, I don't know because you know we also believe that there's habitable Earths that are in, you know, maybe outside of our solar system that we can't get get to as well. So. Yeah, there's just so many different endless possibilities regarding, you know, what it can and can't be. And there's, you know, oh, man, like I said, there's just so much stuff that we can get into. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really yeah. mind-blowing stuff that sounds crazy, but when you break it down at the end of the day, it's really not that crazy. Yeah. Maybe we'll, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do it next time. We'll get, we'll, oh. we'll get into it. We'll th I'm down. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, where can people find you online? Where can they get your book? Uh, punkrockandufos.com is my website. Uh, you can buy the book. I have links from there from Amazon, Barnes & Noble. 
as well as through the publisher's website, D'Angelo Publications. But yeah, Amazon, even though they're a big evil corporation, <laughs> when people buy books on Amazon, I think that means I get more royalties. Myself and Cassie, the artist, she gets royalties too. So help out a small artist and small authors <laughs> um, as well. But yeah, no, once again, that, Mike, thank you so much for this opportunity um, to come on. Show and XPX is, you know, one of those bands that early on, I think when people get into punk rock and pop punk, that you kind of grab it, people gravitate towards too as well. So thanks again. And once again, like I said, Hey Suburbia is really meant to kind of invoke nostalgia, but also really um, kind of bring in some, maybe people who are new to the style of music or who, you know, went to an emo night and, you know, may like My Chemical Romance, but has no idea who Jawbreaker is, right? So it's really kind of informative as well. And it's really written in a way where, you know, um, it's something easily, easily digestible. And like I said, yeah, I pulled for it. Was, it wasn't just bands I interviewed. You know, there's bands, in, you know, Blink-182 is in here, Taking Back Sunday, uh, Descendants, Ackline Trio, New Found Glory, uh, Saves the Day, uh, Every Time I Die. Those are some of the bands that are interviewed in here. But there's also people who work behind the scenes, publicists, uh, tour managers, um, other writers, other editors. So I really try to, you know, incorporate as many people as possible to try to tell the story about this time period for many, which was the greatest time periods of our lives. Absolutely, man. Thanks for doing it and keep writing. Can't wait to see what's next. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Mike DeMonte. Mm -hmm.